Thank you for coming. Welcome to SIARC. For those of you who are not part of SIARC, for those of you who are part of SIARC, thank you for being here on Friday afternoon. Um, it's good that the World Cup games are in the morning. If not, everybody will be somewhere else. Um, I, I, I was thinking before coming here that this is so typical of architects that we, they put a beautiful, extraordinary show, but we, need, we feel we need to talk before about it. <laughs> like we, we need to discuss it because if we don't discuss it, it's, it's like it's not real or it's like it's not legit, legit or something like that. But at the same time, I think um, uh, the environment A, uh, between parentheses, the, the name of the show, curated by our own Herwig and, and Marceline, uh, Herwig Van Garner and Marceline Gao. Um, I, I think it's a very timing, in terms of timing, I think it's the right time to this show. I think, I think the, the, both of them approached this in a very radical way and I, and I let Marceline and Herwig to introduce all the participants and for them to define the criteria why these architects and these designer and, and, the, and, the, and the team that designed the exhibition were selected. But uh, on my end, um, we start talking about a do, to do this show like a, more than a year ago, three years ago. Oh my God, um, time flies, I guess. Um, because for SIAC, uh, the notion of em em environment, sustainability, ecology is always has been a complex subject. It's not an easy subject for us. Uh, and it's not an easy subject because we want to avoid it, but we're always trying to figure out an angle in which we have something else to offer to the conversation. This is, a, this is an issue that's becoming in many ways, uh, fortunately and unfortunately cliche, and uh, in many ways has become a token of justification for a lot of bad stuff in relation to architecture, but also a subject that gives opportunity for a lot of good stuff. Um, so this can go all the way from whatever LEED certification means to a whole series of other speculations in terms of the notion of artificialization of nature or naturalization of artificiality. So it opens a lot of possibilities for the conversation on what it is. So in a way, I, 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 will, I would argue that the, the, the whole process of this, of this show, and I think the show itself, I don't think is a final product or is a finished product. I think it's more about keep opening these questions, and in a way it becomes a platform for us uh, as a school of architecture to try to see how we can contribute to this conversation, if we can contribute to this conversation, or what is the nature of this, or what this means in the context of California, and what does it mean in the context of a waterless world in, in California, and what all these things means in terms of the culture of design. Because again, I would argue as a provocation, and maybe this is something to, on my end to start to, to trigger later in the conversation, is I would argue that the whole notion of sustainability and environment ecology has become in many, many times like a cover as an excuse to get away with very bad architecture ideas or design ideas or landscape ideas. And the question is how we can reclaim that as a territory to have a much more speculative approach and a much more innovative approach. It cannot be that the solution for uh, means of production in relation to this is to go back to the 19th century or that we try to live like, uh, like this is a farm in 1985 somewhere in the countryside or bicycles, which I have nothing against bicycles, but it's kind of a tragedy that we all celebrate in 2018 that the best thing we can come, ideas of these things are like bicycles or solar, only solar panels of good ventilation buildings, who nobody would argue against that. There is not argument against that. Who would be against the idea to try to produce a better world in those, in those terms? But the question is, what else can be brought into, in these terms? What else can be open? Or what else can be cracked as a speculation in terms of what this world means? So at least from my point of view, when, when, uh, when, when I asked Herwig and, and Marceline to, to curate a show like this, we really, we really have no clear end sight what, what this will be, what will be the right people to invite, what will be the criteria to it. But it was more to say, you know what, doesn't matter we get it right or wrong. The question is, can we create a different discourse around this? 
can we create different questions in relation to this? And in that sense, at first glance, I will, at least I would argue that the show does that. Um, we'll see what are the reaction. We'll see what is the provocation. I have the feeling that um, when, when you guys were talking with the press this morning and so on, that it's for sure it's going to be polemic. I don't think it's going to be so well received or or not. Maybe we'll get surprised. But that's beside the point. The point was, can we introduce a provocation to the context of this world, which is something that because we mention it so many times, we think that everybody understands what do we mean by that. And at this point, I'm not so sure that those things means anything anymore. And I think maybe the exhibition and this brief, uh, this brief panel, because even if it's an hour, is a really very short conversation to try to tap on all this. This maybe is the beginning of a different kind of conversation that also can illuminate a path for us in the school to try to develop an agenda around these subjects. So um, I would like to thank, first and foremost, Marcin and Herwig for the titanic effort. And without further ado, I would like to pass the ball to Marceline to get Thanks. the conversation going. Thank you, Hernan. Um, so as, as with any endeavor on the scale of this exhibition, uh, this was the collected effort of many individuals. Um, so I just want to kick off by thanking you guys. Many of you are here tonight. Some of you couldn't be here, but... Um, so first and foremost, we'd like to thank our SciArc director and CEO, who sits next to me, Hernan Diaz Alonso, um, for the invitation to curate this exhibition. And we'd like to thank Hernan and SciArc vice director, John Enright, for believing in the idea and making the exhibition uh, possible as it is today. Um, we would also like to extend our gratitude to SciArc's Public Programs Manager, Stephanie Atlin. Um, we'd like to thank those who have generously supported the exhibition. Uh, the Consulate General of Switzerland has been very uh, generous with their support and the Swiss Touch Table this morning, uh, where we had some discussions. Um, the Spain USA Foundation, the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, and Matt Construction were all uh, supporters of this endeavor. Our special thanks go to Gunter Vogt, Violetta Burkhardt, and Simone Kroll, who are here tonight from Vogue Landschafts Architekten for creating the amazing landscape uh, that we will visit right after this uh, symposium. We'd also like to thank all the exhibitors, Izaskan Chinchilla Architects, Gilles Retzen, Enrique Rezgeli, Estudio Carme Pinos, and Coop Himablau. Um, we owe an enormous thank you to the student team who realized this exhibition and devoted their, their unending energy to this project over the past uh, month. You guys have been truly amazing and transformational. This could never have happened without you. Um, Anna and Tony, Juan Cardenas, Elena Davidson, Ross Fernandez, Andres Gandara, Jose C. Garcia, Ashley Hastings, Cheng Shi Hu, Jin Su Kim, Andy Magner, Evan Mason, Andrea Velasco, Juan Villarreal, Abigail Warners, Danny Wills, Leah Wolfman, and Runzi Zhang. Thank you guys so much. Um, and um, we'd also like to thank the SIRC Communications Department and Media Department uh, with this symposium. And an extra special thanks to the SIRC shop and SIRC facilities who have also been truly amazing uh, in helping us realize this exhibition. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Hervig, who will tell you a bit about what's in the exhibition, and then I'll say a few more words, and we'll then uh, have some statements from the panel. OK. Um, so I just want to maybe explain a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how many of you had a chance to look at the show yet, but we obviously going to open up after this. And we have some images up here. I just wanted to <clears throat> maybe describe a little bit what the elements are. And uh, I'm sure we're going to talk quite a bit about the concept. So we've been working with, uh, with uh, Günther Vogt's office uh, over the past, oh, it feels almost like a year, uh, but it hasn't been that long, I guess, over half a year on this, on this landscape, which is essentially uh, this uh, sloped uh, plane that we established kind of as a new ground in the gallery. Uh, that plane is uh, uh, constructed out of uh, recycled um, material from uh, the demolished uh, bridge and other construction sites in Los Angeles to kind of like establish like a new datum inside a gallery. And then we had a series of these, uh, you see these kind of uh, 
uh, uh, tank caps, which are caps for water containers, essentially, that we reused and repurposed to, uh, to do a couple of different things. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, there's two of them that deal with the landscape and with the idea of water, um, which has been a theme uh, throughout the whole exhibition. Maybe just to quickly elaborate on that, we, uh, we basically traced um, and part of it is a critique of how we use water in Los Angeles specifically and uh, trace the kind of like pathway from the water from the Owens Valley all the way through Los Angeles, LA River to, to the ocean. Um, so the landscape is kind of a reflection uh, of the vegetation in the Owens Valley and then there is a sound installation that is installed in the plants that is interactive, which is essentially a sound map that, um, uh, that we traced uh, from the Owens Valley all the way um, uh, to the ocean. And so there's different kind of like environments that you will hear as in, in, the ex in, the, in the exhibition. And then there is uh, two uh, of these uh, uh, bowl-shaped elements are filled with uh, tar from the La Brea tar pits. Um, and um, and uh, a kind of a, a reflection on like uh, a, a kind of condition, a pretty unique condition in this town that we have, which has a continuously oozing out of tar out of the ground in the middle of the city, uh, right next to LACMA, and keeps on continuing to bring up fossils and, and things like this to the surface. And um, there's a museum built around it, et cetera. So we wanted to implement that also in the show. Uh, and then uh, one of the balls, uh, or the other five balls, it basically uh, um, each uh, is dedicated to one of the uh, designers, architects, thinkers that we invited for the show uh, to um, uh, show a, a specific project um, or a series of projects that are related to the topic of sustainability and environmental and we, I think each one of you guys are going to talk about this uh, specifically, but um, uh, most of the balls deal with a reflection, so there's a projection that uh, we are projecting into water, into these balls are filled with water. Again, this is kind of like uh, really trying to produce an environment rather than just uh, you know just a, a screen or something like this. So it, it has to do with really the smell, the sound, the fact that you have to. Uh, it's a challenging landscape to walk on, as you will see. You need good shoes uh, to kind of walk through this also, and that was in purpose also so that you have to really engage with this landscape, and it's not just uh, an object in the space where you can just look at it uh, from a distance, but it's something that you have to really engage and experience with. So. Those are kind of the pieces and elements, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about it. I just want <clears throat> to briefly uh, introduce uh, all the participants. So, um, Günter Vogt's office, uh, as I already mentioned, Günter Vogt and Violetta Burkhardt and Simon Kroller. Simon is somewhere back there. <laughs> um, I have been really great collaborators, and uh, they have an office in Zurich, uh, but also in Paris, London, and Berlin, I believe. And um, uh, I think uh, Günther is also teaching at the ETH, has been teaching at Harvard, um, et cetera. Um, uh, landscape architects. Then um, Isas Conchinchila, she's uh, from Spain, Madrid, uh, teaches at the Bartlett and is an architect, I guess, working both in Spain and, and London. Um, Gilles Redson, also uh, Belgium, uh, architect, works in London, also teaches um, at the Bartlett. Um, next to me, Enrique Gelli, um, Cloud9. Uh, many fantastic projects from Barcelona. Um, joined us and has a lot of fantastic projects to, to, to show in here. Um, uh, Kupimo Blau, uh, Austrian architecture firm, well known here. Uh, also teaching here at SIAC, and uh, Wolf couldn't make it today, but he has uh, uh, some fantastic project also in the show. Uh, Kame Pinoche, um, also from Barcelona, has a series of projects that address uh, sustainability um, and, um, and, uh, and kind of like engage the subject. So when we, uh, maybe just a brief word, when we invited uh, the, the people <clears throat> participating in the show, we also, we wanted to really give a range of different attitudes towards sustainability. So I think each one of you have a very unique approach uh, to the subject. And so we're really curious to hear from you guys um, uh, to, um, 
to hear what you what you have to uh, to say. I also want to welcome <coughs> Vittorio De Palma um, and um, Mario Catrotto. Uh, both uh, uh, Vittorio is at, at USC um, and has um, uh, is a professor there, and it's also a very a um, lot of writings and ideas about landscape and. Uh, uh, Marika is uh, our own SIAC faculty, and she's also the um, uh, coordinator of history theory. So I think um, I want to kind of pass the word on to you. Uh, I was actually, yeah, to me, I think. Yeah, to you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so just uh, right. <laughs> then, then we pass to Victoria yeah, okay. and Marika. Yeah. So um, just to explain a little bit about our thinking behind this whole show. Uh, that when Hernan invited us to do an exhibition on, you know, we were talking about different ideas of, okay, what could be the word nature? What does that conjure? Um, the word environment. Uh, how do we start to think about these, these different concepts? And so it began a long discussion about the idea of authenticities and about the idea of origins and multiple histories and alternative futures. Um, we started to think about what it would mean to create some kind of reconstituted landscape within the space of, uh, of the school. And how could we think, what really is a landscape? How, does, how could a landscape provoke us to become more aware of how we treat the built environment um, and how we think about the buildings that are around us, uh, many discussions, many concerns of all of us uh, as architects and, and theorists and uh, our students um, having to do increasingly with uh, discussions about depleting resources, climate change, and uh, how that's impacting the built environment, adaptive reuse, you know, all these things are really um, becoming hugely important questions. Um, and so we wanted to create something that would provoke a thought about where these things that are in the gallery have come from, what are their origins, uh, and what are they now? So everything in that space has been extracted from either an infrastructural, you know, the, the, the Sixth Street Bridge, the concrete from the channel of the LA River, maybe we're in a future landscape where that has been jackhammered out and that's what we're walking on. Uh, the water cisterns that are really holding reservoirs, these, these tank caps, um, the tar from the La Brea tar pits, all of these things have been extracted from sites that are not within the school and brought here, brought together um, to kind of begin to coexist and begin to provoke us to think about the life cycle of the things around us. Think about the, the infrastructure right outside of these walls. Think about the buildings that are currently being built. And what happens to all that stuff? Like where, where does it go when it's no longer uh, being used for its, its uh, first and foremost uh, purpose, the intended purpose. And how can we start to project another life onto these things, and what kinds of narratives and, and histories might they begin to conjure for us? Um, so everything, you know, the remote extraction of things, the, the, the conversation then really evolved as we, uh, when we invited Vogtlandschaftsarchitekten uh, to design the exhibition landscape. And that really began a whole conversation that I think we'll, we'll talk, you guys will talk more about maybe with the uh, Owens Valley and, and the connection between Los Angeles and that remote site from where we draw a significant amount of our resources and that's now being uh, kind of redirected back there to mitigate problems uh, with dust that that's produced. Um, so I think that the intention, really, um, of the show is to raise these questions to invite you to uh, either view this landscape from above or to move across it to slowly actually encounter, again, very much the, the physical uh, surface that you're walking on um, and to begin to kind of think about um, where, where these things have come from and what they could be in the future. Um, and how they take on a new life. So I think with that, we'll now hand over to Vittoria De Palma for some comments, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you so much for inviting me here to SIARC to be part of this event. Uh, I had the 
opportunity yesterday, I came over in the afternoon and I had the opportunity to go into the exhibit. And at that point, I think the plan was that we were all going to be somehow perched on stools on this kind of very uneven ground with the audience likewise kind of in this space or maybe looking over it. And so I had a whole, um, when I envisioned speaking to you, I really thought of us all being in that space. Um, being here instead in the room with these images um, on the wall changes things, I think, in a kind of interesting way. Um, and in particular, really, the way in which this exhibition is in dialogue with, um, I would say, three different things that come to my mind in particular when I go there. One being the notion of landscape uh, that Marcelin was also talking about before, another um, uh, land art, and then the third, this notion of environment. And so I just want to go through those three uh, briefly to think about how they start to uh, uh, kind of play out within the exhibition space. So first, if we think about the notion of environment, and we think of it as the representation of a certain area of space with the various objects in it, as Samuel Johnson defines it in his uh, Dictionary of the English Language of 1756, I think that it's very clear that the exhibition space does represent a landscape, and in particular, the landscape of Los Angeles. But it's a Los Angeles that's being seen very much from a particular lens. And it's the lens which is focusing on its resources and its lack of resources. So this whole way in which the link to the Owens Valley and the way that the Owens River serves as this kind of lifeblood of water for the city is represented um, in the planters with plants and vegetation that were kind of poached or bushnapped from the Owens Valley and uh, smuggled back into the Cyart Gallery. Uh, the original intention, in fact, what I read was that the surface was not going to be these reclaimed materials, but actually dust, kind of saline dust from the Owens Lake bed. Uh, the problem is that just as in the Owens Valley, this dust creates a kind of toxic pollution. I think it would have done so also in the gallery further creating these, um, these issues. And, um, and so, and then also these sounds of the LA River that are uh, triggered as one walks around the room. And then these La Brea tar pits, the La Brea tar pits that are excavated here in Los Angeles in 1913, the very same year that the Los Angeles aqueduct opens and then begins the gradual draining of Owens Lake. So there are all of these coincidences that are kind of historical and geographical and tied to geology and natural resources that, that are all being mapped. And really what the show presents from a landscape perspective is Los Angeles as a city of oil and of water and of dust. Now if we turn then to earth art, I think there are clearly a lot of works that come to my mind when I look at it. Um, I think in the, some of the material that Marceline sent me, there's Michael Heitzer's North, East, Southwest at the Dia Gallery, the Dia Beacon, uh, Walter de Maria's Earth Room, of course, uh, Smithson's notion of the non-site. These are some works that precisely derive their power from bringing material from somewhere else outside of the gallery within the pristine gallery space and disrupting that space by the presence of these materials in it. But really now I just want to move to this notion of environment or environmental as the, the show is, is titled because that brings a slightly different perspective onto what is happening within that space. So the Western notion of environment can really be traced all the way back to Hippocrates and his treatise, Airs, Waters, Places. Now the intention of that treatise um, was for uh, the Greek doctor to give advice to other doctors who might be going to a strange town and needing to diagnose diseases. Essentially, what he counseled was that these doctors should be looking at the air, looking at the water, and looking at the characteristics of the inhabitants in order to help with their diagnosis. So essentially, it's the air and it's the water which are directly uh, coming into people's bodies and generating certain characteristics. So uh, places with clear water and good air would create healthy people. Other places with stagnant air and um, kind of you know, floating water, stagnant water would produce disease. 
Uh, so there's this clear correlation between air, water, and bodies that presumes a kind of exchange, shall we say, between the environment and the organisms within it. And so embedded in Hippocrates' ideas of the environment was a kind of permeability, I would say, between objects and their surroundings, to the extent that we can almost say that objects are not stable entities, but rather uh, kind of momentary thicknesses within a kind of more generalized medium. So if we turn back to the exhibition and think about, well, what does this term environment or this title environment give us that the term landscape might not? One of the things that comes to mind for me is that really what we're if we think about landscape as a term that is absolutely uh, predicated on a notion of boundary, on a kind of distinct boundary that separates one area from another area, or the boundary could be the frame of a picture, whatever it is, there are many ways. But landscape and boundary are two words that are always linked together. Environment, instead, seems to go against this. Environment challenges notions of authorship, of spectatorship and of agency. And it's precisely this notion of environment in which we have, uh, we don't have objects with clear borders, but rather we have this kind of thick substance in which there are momentary intensities where I think some of the really interesting parts of this exhibition can come out. The fact that um, unfortunately the La Brea Tar is going to have to be taken out pre precisely because it's creating a kind of toxic atmosphere is um, I think a very interesting uh, if unexpected and in some ways unfortunate, but also interesting uh, uh, kind of result, just as this dust that couldn't have been brought in because of the toxicity. So really, I think that the notion of environment, when brought into an exhibition like this and brought into dialogue with the works that are being exhibited here, um, could, in fact, because of the radical way that it undermines notions of objectivity, of boundary, of identity, could, in fact, make for a very radical uh, proposition indeed. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, <clears throat> did you, Harry, did you also have, or did, should we go to Marika? I think we should just move on okay. to that. Um, so, Marika. Yeah. Much less structured thoughts to follow that treatise, um, which was fantastic. Um, one thing I want to point out, sorry, about the word, um, the word environment, if not the idea, the Western notion of environment, uh, is that as far as I understand, it was an import. It was it was a um, an import by Thomas Carlyle in the 19th and the early 19th century, um, as he was trying to find an adequate way to describe the German term Umgebung, um, which literally means surroundings or that which surrounds us. And I find that interesting. So so environment is not something other. It's not something that exists by itself apart from people but it presupposes a notion that the subject is there and that the subject is being affected by it. Um, when you uh, talk about the notion of um, sort of the very ancient medical notion of airs, waters, and places, of course that has a rich legacy within architecture. We can go back to people like Alberti spending a huge portion of his treatise talking about how one places and why one places architecture, where one places it, um, and how one should, one should examine the spleen of cattle, for instance, to discover whether or not a site is adequate for architecture. Um, so I think environment in, in the context of architecture is always about the human, um, and it's always about the, really, the fuzzy, the problematically fuzzy relationship between that human and all those particulates and all those germs and all of those invasive things that constitute our surroundings at any given time. So when I think about it in the context of a show like this, I'm also fascinated by the, the apparent toxicity uh, involved in bringing the environment into Cyarch. Um, I think it's useful, actually, for us to consider the environment as something potentially dangerous, potentially already polluting, already polluted, something already deeply compromised, and something that we're all also actively constituting by our being there, that it would not otherwise exist if we were not there. Um, so 
in the same way that the tar is not is not known as such or not problematized as such until it becomes excavated, until it becomes a librea tar pit, until some part of it is brought to the Sayar Gallery, and you know starts making us a little lightheaded, um, <laughs> potentially. <laughs> Um, um, in the same way, I think we actually, it would be helpful for us as architects and as architectural thinkers to realize that it is our relationship to that, to that surrounding that turns it into environment to begin with. It doesn't exist by itself. It isn't pristine out there someplace. But it's always an infectious transfer from us out and from out to us. So for instance, when we think about the related concept of uh, von Uxkill's Umwelt, sorry, terrible German pronunciation going on here. <laughs> um, and we think about his notion of what constitutes the individual environment that makes up um, an ecological system for any particular entity. Um, one that always comes to mind as, as a particularly compelling example is the extent to which the atmosphere becomes part of the biome just through the process of breathing. So I think we would have experienced that in an even more intense way if we'd been able to get the dust. And then we would have been like, you know, inhaling the dangerous carcinogenic particulates as well as the, the fumes of the, of the um, tar. So too bad that couldn't, that danger was avoided because um, that would have been a super intense experience. Um, but I think it's also helpful for us, for us to realize that when, we t that when we talk about the kind of extent to which our um, our being is connected to everything else out there, it doesn't necessarily mean that objects are being compromised. It just means that they're being constituted other than we might normally perceive them as being. And I also think that's helpful for us to keep in mind as architects and as architectural thinkers. So it's, it's not then that because the boundary gets fuzzy or because the boundary is differently construed that those boundaries don't exist but that we are part of making those boundaries, and we are responsible for the boundaries that we make, the kinds of boundaries that they are, the way they're drawn, and what materials, the ramifications that they have, how we imagine them, how we visualize them, what aesthetics we give them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, my main point is that we own that. We do that. We make that up. It's not something that exists out there. It's something that we can bring into our gallery, we can design, we can talk about, we can constitute, we can take the tar in, we can bring it out. I'd be curious uh, to hear perhaps uh, Gunther and Violetta, what you uh, think in response to some of, some of these uh, comments. <laughs> Thank you first for the invitation to speak here and I have to say I'm, very happy that the first time we were invited by architects because we had several exhibition, several co collaboration, but always with artists. And I think, meanwhile, architects understand that the so-called environment is a question. And it's <clears throat> and we started 20 years ago with the first co collaboration, and since then, I constantly had discussions with architects and couldn't we show it, couldn't we do an exhibition, but here it's the first time that it's in the context of architecture. It was always with Olaf Eliasson, with Dan Graham, with Philipp Ursprung, even at the ETH, it's all only with the art world. It was never in collaboration with the architects. So therefore I'm very happy that finally it arrives at the architectural world. and. Um, I think <clears throat> there are so many things in it. When you mention environment or in German Umwelt, in, in Europe, if you say environment or Umwelt, it means a space full of problems. So it's, it's really the definition. Environment means this is a space full of problems. And therefore, we prefer this expression landscape, not nature, because especially in Switzerland, all architects are constantly talking about nature, and we are constantly saying, this is not nature. And then they are saying, <coughs> it's ecologically right or wrong. Then I say, but you can say, I find it right or wrong. You cannot say it's ecologically right or wrong. I just mentioned if you would have a nuclear fallout here in Los Angeles, ecology would just describe what happens afterward. It's not right or wrong. We say it's right or wrong. Ecolo ecology is a natural science, 
and it's not describing it's right or wrong. And I think for us it was really important to create somehow a, a common ground and <clears throat> we were very happy in the end that we couldn't take the soil uh, from, the, from the landscape, so we had to use soil already being here. And for me, <clears throat> a city is like a geological monument. And I just described, when you look at this, it looks like rocks. And, um, but uh, I saw some students working here, and I always read, it's a hybrid. And then I'm asking, but what, what are the parents in for this, to create this kind of hybrid? And these are hybrid rocks. And I just uh, mentioned this morning, <coughs> imagine we would grind all these stones, reuse it for the, the construction industry, and we do it three, four times, and the end of this uh, process would be a new material. We don't even have a name for it, but what is it if you reuse it three, four times? It's a completely new material. Now it's concrete or mixed material, and then we are, we are <coughs> meanwhile, in the construction industry in a kind of geological process, and that's for me very interesting. So it's, it's relating to science more and more, and in the exhibition you could see the, how in the new um, food industry or in the El Bulli, it's very close to science. And so it's more, and even the art world is coming very close to science. And I think, especially here and at the SIOC, you are <coughs> going towards science. And that's for me very interesting. Um, also, when we, were, when we were talking and discussing internally and with Marceline and Herwig, and we realized that there were a lot of sort of words that were starting to pop up, which um, were linked but did not mean the same thing, uh, and which usually are um, they're used um, they're used very loosely uh, during this uh, sort of sustainability discourse. And I think one of the major ones was this idea of nature and what nature means. Um, and in terms of landscape, and as landscape architects, understanding landscape not from this uh, sort of perspective of nature as something that can be tamed or as a commodity, but also as a cultural production, um, which also gives it its other, 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 another aesthetic. Um, in the room, it was also interesting to take elements that are there and maybe um, the scale of these elements uh, in the city and in, in the landscapes um, um, makes it difficult to put them together, but then suddenly bringing the, the La Brea uh, in, 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 into the gallery space and then bringing the, 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 the debris and the rubble um, as, a, as a space which is also difficult to walk on, um, also kind of, kind of reinforcing this idea of landscape not being something that should be uh, necessarily easy. Um, because when speaking and thinking about environment, um, it's exactly the complications that make it a difficult topic. And making an exhibition about the topic meant also and how to use the space and how to, through this sort of a movement through the exhibition room um, tackle this this idea. So perhaps uh, Enrique, maybe? would you like to come? Because uh, it was mentioned El Bulli. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Got my. Okay, I have to do three inceptions in these little little minutes uh, I have. So one is. Um, since we have a students, we have faculty and, and curators, and great to be with Hernan. It's exactly the point about, about Sayer to discuss. It's not about sustainable or design, but imagine you have this little, little piece of concrete as all the floor on the exhibition space. And, and here you have a seat. Well, what is this concrete going to do for us? Well, weight, resistance, weight. If it's like that, thermal and weight, 
three things as a performance. What is this seed going to do for us? Well, it's going to grow, it's going to produce fruits, it's going to produce even medicine, it's going to learn from nature in terms of knows where the wind is, knows where the water is, and is a factory of factories of oxygen. Mutates, has information, knows the level of the geothermal, addresses the structure according to a nest of birds, produces shadow, produces a structure, habitat, energy, deals with water. That's the performance of this seed. So if we see architecture closer to this concrete little block or we see architecture closer to this, that's what we should do. Make a decision, right? Move closer to this, passive, let's say, or even get closer. I think that the environmental discussion is how radical architecture gets closer to this seed. And, and I think we are in a moment, as science uh, tell us, that we can very much get there. Uh, when I finished in 2010 the Media City building uh, in Barcelona, so Ferran came to us, we, we are friends for many years, and, and uh, Hernan, I know you are in touch with him too. Um, and he said, you do nitrogen buildings. You use nitrogen as a vertical cloud to protect the building against the, the sun in the middle of August. So the building produces this vertical cloud against the sun. And then he said, and I cook with nitrogen. So I said, all right, so we can talk the same language. And then we started to do a bully foundation. And by being there on that landscape, we understood that if he has decode cuisine to this molecular scenario where he deals with nitrogen, and then the landscape, it's not this postcard that we take when we get there, but on the contrary, it's this salinity suspended that comes from the sea, and there is salinity over the air, and there is geothermal right there, and then you start to understand the way photosynthesis operates, the CO2 emissions, that are polluting because of the mobility in the area. And, and you start to uh, scanning very precisely over days and using light and particles. And then you, you don't see this postcard anymore. What you see is a 3D file of 9 million particles, what that, that landscape is. So if the landscape is these particles and the cuisine, the kitchen, his science is also molecular, but well, we cannot do architecture of windows, roofs, and doors. That's not the same language. That's not going to talk to each other. So that's what we are trying to do. And uh, hopefully by, by June next year, you'll finish, we'll finish the construction, and you, you're all welcome to come and continue the debate. Um, when we, we want to talk about glass, we talk about salinity. When we want to talk about wood, we talk about CO2 emissions and storage, and, and so, yeah, we need to decode architecture as they did uh, in the industry of cuisine, and you have seen how well the chefs have done, also here in the States, decoding, producing this new language. So I fully agree with Hernan, it's, it's not about sustainable and, and green and lead, and there's all this marketing, of course, but it's essential. If the problem is the atmosphere, there's no roof solution. We are attacking the atmosphere by seed clouding or other projects. And then maybe the third inception, if I have time, I have, okay, is um, uh, activism. Okay, I, I, I took this plane, crazy plane, from Barcelona, London, via Chicago, okay, to be here three and a half minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> three and a half or four minutes. Yeah. Don't tell me about the footprint, okay, guys? But because I think is, uh, um, Sire has done it with architecture, has done it with the digital discussion, has done it with the fiction uh, a scenario of architecture, well, we need you guys as activists, as an activist role in this three moment, in this, in this what Jeremy Rifkin calls this civilization of empathy. So he called me to do this workshop, uh, uh, kind of a, workshop, three days workshop. And I said, well, where is the workshop? They mark Europe, green countries, right? He said, Texas. I said, are you sure you want to start doing workshops of green agendas and green thinking in Texas? Really? 
yes, we must start by the worst case. <laughs> yeah, indeed, that San Antonio workshop was indeed the worst case. So imagine the mayor of San Antonio, $18 billion check to build two nuclear power plants. Ready. And then someone said, someone from his team said, why don't we do a workshop before you sign this check? This check has 40 years footprint. The Society of Texas, San Antonio, will pay this check for, for 40 years. You don't want to have a workshop just before that? Well, sure, let's do it. So imagine a U, a U table like this with some Excel files. Eh? The, the, our weapons were Excel files. The Japanese lobby, sorry, Hernan, eh? the Japanese lobby and the French lobby selling nuclear power plants, and here, a bunch of architects and landscape architects and engineers on the other side with Jeremy discussing what is good, what is bad. And they were saying, yeah, but what do you do when you have no wind and your wind turbines? Sure, sure. Yes, but what about waste, nuclear waste? How do you manage with that? <laughs> and the major here in the center making notes. Two, three, seven, eight, no? How is, no? After three, uh, so we were more or less very equal, in fact. It's not so clear that green is green, right? And what happened was uh, we had a last chance, and Jeremy said as a, last son, as a last chance, how many people will work on your nuclear power plants? And the Japanese, ah, it's you, dear mayor, you'll get the information on your cell phone, don't worry. 80 engineers working on these power plants. And then Jeremy and us, we said, well, our job is more like retrofitting the whole country is more about four million green jobs for the next 10 years, changing roofs, changing plants, changing elevation, retrofitting buildings, starting by public education, going into mobility, changing infrastructure, bridges, water pipes. But if you can do it with two nuclear plants and nothing happens, sure. You understand the active role of us in that fight, in that Excel fight, yeah? So that was my third inception. So perhaps, uh, I think in terms of activism, maybe that's something that connects a little bit to some of the things that Izaskun has been speaking about. Well, it's difficult because so many things have been said so far that <laughs> it's almost impossible to react to everything. So what I would say is, uh, maybe for me, the question that is more urgent, because it's on top of the table of all of us, and because we have the answer in a university environment and in an architect and designer environment, is this relationship between ecology and innovation. I think uh, activists will come on, at the end of my intervention. Um, I think um, the, um, let's say, a emergency comes when, uh, many times comes in architecture when something new comes from the outside of the architectural culture. It has happened before in history, like for example, new materials were not invented by architects, but they were, let's say, pushing the architectural tradition in a very unexpected way for the, for the architects. Ecology has done the same. It's not something that we have chosen. It's something that has been imposed, and the politicians are asking us, hi guys, what are you going to do about this? Because it's an emergency, it's an urgency, and you have to give answers. So I think um, usually what architects tend to do is saying, okay, this is something new that is not radically changing anything. So they just apply new materials or ecology to a very small segment of what we are doing that is the decision making on top of our table. So the first reaction of architects uh, towards ecology is, okay, we can put solar panels or we can use wood or we can use timber or we can use renewable materials or we can use bioclimatism. It's something that is just depending on us. It's just about drawing differently and adding new uh, features. But I think when, uh, and this has happened in history more times, like for example, the sample of new materials, when this evolve a little bit, there is a reaction in which we realize that the most important innovation is not what happens on top of our table. It's not about drawing space and shape. It's for me in two very particular sides. One is the sociology of the commission, 
and the other is the physical uh, implications of our architect architectural answer. I think, um, if for example, you look at the use of steel and concrete at the beginning of the, or at the end of the 19th century, uh, when there wasn't a real shift on the sociology of the commission and people were doing 19th century houses that were done with steel, it was quite banal and superficial because at the end, the sociology was not matching the, the material. Uh, but when somebody say, okay, this is a new thing and the sociology of the commission has to change. We, now, our work now is the workers' house. It's not anymore like the house for rich people, it's the workers' house. Then things start to change deeply. And I think the innovation with uh, ecology now is precisely about lifestyle. It's not anymore about adding solar panels or uh, making wood solutions or even putting windmills on top of buildings is about rethinking how we are really inhabiting the planet and coming with new solutions for transportation, density, growth, development, thinking that maybe all these questions uh, were having, let's say, not so uh, achievable answers. And I think it's also a question of changing the, uh, the little signs from the idea of that we were in an empty world and that architects were fabricating new things from scratch, we were using raw materials to make things, uh, to see that the world is already full. And we are just, uh, let's say, uh, aligned with materiality for a small bit of time uh, in a very big life, life span. So my suggestion to all the architects here and all the students on architecture, would be not to think that uh, the innovation that ecology requires is based in technology as a, let's say, device uh, philosophy that you can plug in in a space that is radically similar to the modern culture. I think the issue now is to, to see how, uh, let's say, the policy, the agency of how we inhabit the world, how we, our lifestyle is affecting uh, our environment can be rethink. And I think this is a major innovation. It's not about changing a little bit the spaces or changing a little bit the materials. It's about changing how we really inhabit. And uh, I think it's also about uh, a different relationship with the, with the world and the time in which we are considering our responsibilities happening. This expansion of time affects not only the moment in which we are creating a project, but many more years before and after. That's what I can say. That's my activism. Thank you. <laughs> and perhaps Jill, would you like to comment? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's already a lot to mention. So I mean, maybe we can talk just a little bit about the installation, like how it, uh, where it came from. So it started a little bit from uh, kind of um, Andreas Gurski like moment because <laughs> I knew there was this landscape it changed color in the beginning it was green and then it became gravel and then it became rocks and um, so in, in Gurski's photographs you always see in a way a vision of nature but then it's there's in a small detail you see that that nature is somehow artificial like you'll see a bridge or you will see some kind of intervention so that, that was also really the idea in a way with this installation to put something on Vogt on Gunther's landscape that was kind of disrupting it a little bit, right? Or kind of adding an element that is radically not natural and that and that, that is maybe more infrastructural on top of that. And then combined to that was also, and I agree also there with Hernan, I mean, this kind of initial cringing, if you hear the word ecology or environment, where you said like, oh, this is gonna be greenwashing and we have to be good and, uh, you know, uh, and so then that came also a bit the idea of like looking at ecology and also at the landscape not as something that is outside of uh, that is outside of our control but that is very much you know the environment and the way how we see it in the press today is the result of a system of production of a capitalist system of production that kind of makes us live in in this like polluted and all of a sudden dangerous and problematic environment so that's also why then the way how I kind of frame or thought about this installation is to understand it not as a form, but much more as a system of production that starts to also involve ideas of labor and production in this debate about environment. Because essentially the rubble that you see on the floor in the gallery is 
fundamentally part of that kind of capitalist system of production. It's, it's cement, it's the fifth biggest polluter in the world. It's produced by really large companies like Lafarge Holtzim, which uh, to make a cement factory you need a lot of capital. So that there, is, there is a kind of a clear relationship between a way of thinking about, um, about capital and production and about this rubble that is there on the floor. So what my installation is kind of trying to interrogate is if we could figure out how the digital or technology can actually help us rethink production chains and can actually produce things in a very stupid and very simple way. So the installation is made of cardboard. It costs $100 to make it. And it's, it's automated. It's just cut, right? And you can, um, it kind of implies a certain accessibility and the idea that you don't need to build up this very large and heavy and dangerous infrastructure within all the, the consequences that it has for, for capital. So that's kind of one thing about the installation. And then maybe one other note, just briefly, about, in a way, the, the kind of, because we mentioned, you mentioned modernism as well. And I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of modernism, right? And it's, a, it's, it's um, you know, the kind of utopian idea of progress. And in a way, what the environmental discussion and kind of the greenwashing brought into architecture was a little bit what Peter Sloterdijk, when he talks about postmodernism, it's kind of a similar moment. So Sloterdijk says, like, you know, in, in modernism, you had, you had a car and you drive fast with your car, right? And then in postmodernism, you have your fast car, but you're in a traffic jam and you, and you don't move forward. And it's kind of a similar moment, I think, with um, if you get confronted with all these policies about, about, about the environment, is that all of a sudden we can do so much, but you're kind of stuck in a traffic jam where you, in, in modernism, you had pure lightness, but now in this kind of this, this environment of laws and rules, all of a sudden your buildings have to be fat, right? And they, they don't have to be fat for any structural reasons, but they become fat and slow and heavy and, and not anymore transparent because of this, this, this kind of green laws, right? And I think it's interesting that then, and that's also one thing that the installation tries to do and that my work tries to do, is take that idea of fatness on board, right? And kind of, kind of do things that are, in a way, making excessive use of those uh, requirements that buildings have to become fat, right? So this installation as well, is, it's, it's, it's fat. It's, it, there's, you know, it's, it's kind of volumetric and it starts to play with that idea of how we can get out of this traffic jam and how we can, again, start to kind of abandon this, um, yeah, this, this, this kind of um, block, this kind of postmodern moment that there is no more solution out of there and you have to kind of stop moving. I think, it, I mean, there's an interesting tie back that I see between what you're just bringing up, Jill, about the, um, the kind of space of production versus the image value of the work. Um, and it, it made me think about something that Gunther was uh, speaking about this morning, about the origin of uh, the word, well, how landscape is translated in different languages, that paysage, uh, landschaft, landscape, um, the difference between these origins being either something to do with the imaging of a territory, um, a kind of spatial model that has to do with identity, or um, a territory that is being actively worked upon, like an agricultural territory um, where work is occurring, the Landschaft. Uh, maybe, Gunther, could you possibly? But I, I think it ties a little bit to this idea of these, this model as something uh, that negotiates between those two kinds of understandings of landscape. <coughs> we are constantly talking about language, the so different French, German, and English, and now you introduce territory or infrastructure landscape. These poor words have can infrastructure landscape, for instance, Yesterday I visited uh, the Los Angeles River outside here and the railway lines and the traffic. For me, this is not an infrastructure landscape, it's just infrastructure. It's no more a landscape, it's just infrastructure because for me the landscape is somehow definitely invisible and that's perhaps new So Wherever I go on this world nowadays, there is a new scale arriving on Earth. I give you two examples. One is Chile with the new mines. I flew over these mines and I really thought I'm no longer on Earth. I'm somewhere in the Mars or on the Moon. And <clears throat> then the new newest project in, in Istanbul, where they plan to build a second Bosporus, 
The original is for tourism, the second is for economy, and so meanwhile they are planning the third, Bosporus. And this is quite, <laughs> in terms of ecology, it's out of any discussion, really, out of any discussion, but they are planning to build it. And it's a completely new scale arriving, and, and that, therefore <clears throat> we thought we are really like geomorphic agents. We really believe that even in the scale of geology, we are able to transform this earth. And then when we are talking about territory, what is the scale of this territory, especially when you, we are talking here in Los Angeles in a really big scale, <clears throat> and the scale is constantly growing. And that, that's for me the real problem and the real discussion. How can we still control? And I think we already lost control somehow. That, that's a real problem because it's out of our scale where we can control it. And that's, that's a real uh, difficult question in the future. So how can we control this? And it's, I think it's impossible. It's, it's impossible technically, and it's impossible, especially politically, just to keep the control of our intervention. And it's a wonderful work. Our work has consequences, and we never think about our, the consequences of our work. And that's the real problem. Even if it's a small intervention, what are the consequences? And that's, I think, the real discussion we should have. And, and uh, in the end, you are saying lifestyle. Uh, let's say, how much comfort do we need in our life? And that's a real, especially today, where it's very hot. How much lifestyle? Uh, how much comfort do we need? And how do we get this comfort? And uh, then there we have to go back. And then it has consequences individually for everybody, and in, in architecture and in all our disciplines these consequences, so, and lifestyle is a bit, perhaps, it's really, it's, it's a comfort, finally, in, in uh, what we have to discuss. It's so cold in, in here. We have a similar space at ETH. It's much warmer there. It's just forbidden to have this kind of climatization. It's impossible to have it. It's forbidden in Europe, and uh, therefore we, for me, by the way, it's too cold in here. It's not, it's not really comfortable for me because I'm not used to it. So, but we have to learn to accept, perhaps we, least, we, we have to accept less comfort. And that's, that, this will be extremely consequent. So it's sort of strange to be a historian and be the optimist. Um, but just just two points back. One is you can't say that it's impossible to operate on a large, to operate change on a large scale while acknowledging that we have done precisely that in a negative way. If we've done it in a negative way, we can do it in a positive way. In one way, two, and two, um, one way that we might sort of gain the imaginative courage to do that um, is by remembering, at least in English, where landscape comes from. It comes from landscape. It comes from the notion of how one views, when, how one aestheticizes uh, one's environment. Yes? I'm like, check it. I'm checking. <laughs> um, um, if you're able to imagine the world differently, at least you have the first step, not the, ne not the only necessary step, but, but, it, but at least you have the first step toward being able to make the world differently. I, mean, I just, I want us to keep that in mind. Okay, of course, uh, no doubt we can change the world. It's, it's, the question is, what are the consequences? And I think the problem is the scale we are working in. And we are all, we are not as individual responsible for the large scale, but we are always part of this larger project, like the, the mines in Chile, who is really responsible for it, and who is controlling it. And it's not <clears throat> landscape architects, architects, environmentalists. This is purely economy. It's just economy, nothing else. Well, I always think it's interesting what we accept as given in design. So, I mean, certainly there are things we have to accept as, as given, um, but, I, but, I, but I think we should, we should always be very careful to recognize, all right, right now I'm taking this off the table. 
So if it's, if it's environment that we accept as given, or if it's ecology that we accept as different, or if it's a particular um, uh, political, uh, socio-political uh, condition that we accept as given, um, or if it's just plain, flat out economy that we accept as given. And it's not that, it's not that there's anything wrong with having givens on the table. It's just that I want us to be aware that that's our baseline, that we're saying that's the part we can't change. Um, because as soon as we acknowledge that that's what we've taken off the table, we always have the opportunity to put it back on the table. Um, I think you're right, but also change involves huge amounts of destruction. Um, yes. Trying to go back to, to something that we believe is better, and, and I think it's important to run, try to get away from, from better, worse, good and bad. These are the things that make these discussions um, turn suddenly so biased all the time. Um, of course, even with the LA River, um, the idea of turning this into a river again, when you understand that this thing is going 300 kilometers through the desert in pipes, but suddenly comes into the city and then it's green, and then you, know, you break the concrete, where does, this, where does this concrete go? What energy does it imply to, to break it, to, 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 to bring it back to this to this origin, you know, to this back to this beauty, to this correct way of understanding nature. So, yeah, when I, I'm not sure if that's what you mean with with. Uh, no, I agree with you. We can't go back. But it's it's kind of interesting. We've uh, we have had several workshops here with with Transol over the past couple of years and uh, often the topic came up what you were saying it's like comfort is very subjective and uh, it's culturally really subjective and it, it's uh, the way the Europeans address it is like well we can live with a couple of degrees warmer uh, the way it's often addressed in the US is we're going to throw technology at it you know we're going to make the building smarter we're going to put more panels on the roof we're going to attack this and still chill our spaces down and I think there's like a fundamental shift happening where it's a, is technology really uh, the answer or is there an, a design solution to it, uh, how we can create spaces that are more comfortable, but also like kind of like where's the opportunity here to innovate? I think that's kind of the discussion or the question I think for the panel is like, you know, as a designer and as an architect, like where, where lie the opportunities here in terms of like how can we change things? How can we actually contribute something that's not just a technical solution to a, uh, to a, to a problem, you know. So I guess you must. Maybe I jump in exactly in this point. Uh, the end of the workshop uh, was just quickly, no? After three days, not like a three-year plan, but after three days, he decided that uh, $9 billion was going to go on the construction of one nuclear power plant, not two, but one, and the other $9 billion were going into retrofitting the city of San Antonio and the neighborhood and the territory. So immediately we decided that we were going to team up no, as, a, as part of, of this role of the architects and the designers and all together. But you can imagine how, how big was that project. No? And then uh, some emails started to, to cross about, send me a list of the architects. No? Who are the green architects going to do this job? No? And then suddenly we start sending some names. And then basically we are not ready. On the other side, you have these lobbies of the Japanese and the French getting ready for, the, for, for changing the, the energy plan of, of, a, of, of a state. And on this side, uh, there was, for example, on this side was Arup, and you were mentioning Transflar. On this side, we had to have a green peace army of architects and engineers and ecologists and so on to go for that. So that's, I think we have the knowledge to, to achieve these, these massive uh, interventions if we get organized, if we operate uh, differently uh, where, uni where universities, states, and, and, and start, I mean, but we have to play, we have to play a new game not a studio game, no? We are fine with our studio, with our buildings, net zero buildings. We're happy to do that, but that's 0.000001% of today's reality. So 
the money is there and the economy is there, but we do have to make a role of not being passive about it, but but rather lead 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 the wave, and that's it. Any other thoughts? I, because I, I think, I mean, many, many things came up. Uh, the idea of the borders, boundaries, uh, us and environment, are we all part of environment? I mean, I think the two opening statements uh, from Victoria and Marika um, put that on the table, the ideas of the, the environment also as something that possibly involves danger um, involves threat, involves risk. Um, I, yeah, it's, I mean, it's clear that there is no consensus uh, on how we're thinking of these things. It would be almost impossible to try to, to summarize. Um, but it's actually uh, produced, I think, a series of questions that we can all um, begin to, to work on. And I think, well, we are clearly working on these 